I want to bring to the stage here uh, Nick Hanauer and Kristen Ralph Finkbeiner. Come on up. <clears throat> we hold these truths to be self-evident. Your own theme song, I like yeah, that. Yeah, awesome. Um, and I want to tell you a little bit about both of these uh, folks and, and what it is we're going to talk about here uh, in, in this segment. Um, so, Kristen Ralph Finkbeiner is co-founder and executive director of Moms Rising, which we heard a little bit about uh, uh, this morning from Joan Blades, and we're going to hear a bunch more about uh, when Kristen gets to explain uh, the work they do, uh, to use Annie Leonard's phrase, both online and on land. Um, Nick Hanauer is um, uh, my co-author of uh, The Gardens of Democracy and The True Patriot um, uh, and a, an entrepreneur in the business world but also a uh, profoundly active civic and political entrepreneur uh, here in our state and around the country. And the thing that we're going to be talking about here in this segment uh, is related to a very hard issue. One of those issues that has many, many tributaries upstream that feed the complexity and the complications and the challenge. And that issue is guns. Guns, gun reform, gun responsibility. But what we want to have here is a conversation not about the pros and cons of this measure or that measure of uh, proposals of uh, gun reform or gun control, uh, but about the nature of organizing citizens on an issue like this. Moms Rising, as Kristen will tell us, has been inv in involved uh, super actively at the federal level, lobbying Congress, uh, trying to change the conversation uh, nationally uh, about guns. Uh, and Nick, as he'll explain in a bit, uh, is the uh, catalyzing founder uh, of an organization called the Washington Alliance for Gun Responsibility. Uh, and for full disclosure, I am a part of the uh, posse that helped uh, get that organized. Um, but the, and that work here in the state is just getting underway. Uh, but for both these folks, the challenge here and the opportunity is how to engage citizens, how to engage people like all of us here in the room on an issue where you have a very unusual alignment of circumstances. You have a majority of public opinion favoring reform, favoring certain measures, but you have a political system that does not respond to that majority. And the reason why is that there is a very effective, well-organized minority in operation that helps shape and dictate the frame of the possible within our political process. And so the challenge and opportunity that we're going to have a chance here to discuss is how do we mobilize grassroots citizens? How do we mobilize action uh, when faced with this set of circumstances? When, they're, when you know the people are either with you or moving toward you, and yet the system is not able to or willing to respond. Um, and so let me begin uh, Kristen, with you, and if you would describe some of the work that Moms Rising has been doing uh, around the country and how you've been going about it and, um, and what the impact has been so far. Well, we have over 1.1 million members across the country from every state in the nation. And after the tragedy happened at the Sandy Hook Elementary School, our members emailed us. They called us, they tweeted us, they Facebooked us, and they said, we together have to take action. We together have to flex our citizen muscle. We together have to be heard over the NRA. And what was important in that moment was that at Moms Rising, what we found is that we are really up against two things in terms of having people be able to flex their citizen muscle. One, we are busy people. Everybody here is busy. Three quarters of moms are in the labor force. We are juggling more roles than at any other time in history. And our nation works more hours than at any time in history. So we came together, we said, what can people do? And immediately, people started writing in. Over 150,000 people wrote into Moms Rising and said, we need to update our outdated gun safety laws. We need to look at things like universal background checks, like getting rid of assault weapons in high-capacity magazines, and like making sure that there are federal gun trafficking statutes. And so Moms Rising, in this moment, opened up as many opportunities as possible for people to send in their messages through Facebook, through Twitter, 
through email, through blogs. So really what we're looking at is almost a breathing of our flexing of our citizen model. Moms Rising listening in, Moms Rising bringing out ways for people to engage. And then what we did is we took it a step farther. We went to Walmart and then we said, hey Walmart, you are the highest seller of assault weapons. We're gonna flex our consumer muscle right here. We're gonna say women make 80% of purchasing decisions. Please stop selling them. We are still asking that. I hope you all join us with that. <laughs> We're also asking Congress to move forward those three policies that we just talked about. We delivered uh, member messages. Actually, we had so many member messages that we had to put them, the giant stacks of member messages, onto a tiny thumb drive because we couldn't physically carry them to deliver them. So we delivered thumb drives along with Valentine's to members of Congress along with a choir of singing kids, the World's Children's Choir. Actually, we caroled the Congress and we are continuing to visit. And then we also went to the NRA leadership and we said, please meet with us. We have our member messages that we would like to have you hear. And we sent a letter in advance and then we stepped foot onto their property and they promptly called the police on moms. So we are going at, thing, at, at this issue on a legislative way and a consumer way and in all ways that we can flex our consumer muscle. And we are also listening to our members and opening as many avenues as possible for busy people to take action and to be heard. So thank Great. you. Well, w w one of the things that I want to say before we hear from Nick and, and the wa about the Washington Alliance is that uh, this is an issue, um, though, in our state and in, I think, almost every county in the state, there are majorities that support some of the gun safety measures that Kristen's described. Majorities are not uh, unanimous. Uh, and in this room, there is uh, probably not unanimity on this issue. Uh, but our challenge and opportunity here is to explore this as a case study for how when you have a divided society uh, and you have shifting norms and views about what counts as responsibility and what counts as safety, um, how you create a conversation and create action uh, that makes uh, uh, change possible. So Nick, will you describe a bit uh, uh, just the impetus uh, for getting the Washington Alliance for Gun Responsibility off the ground? Yeah, um, thank you. Uh, so uh, I should say that as, as uh, politically engaged as I am across a broad range of issues, I had never given two seconds of thought to the issues of gun safety and gun responsibility prior to Sandy Hook. But, uh, but in, the, in, in, the, in the eight months prior to that, I had a couple of experiences. Uh, a, a, about a year ago, a young software developer who worked a floor above me for my closest friend uh, was killed, uh, was shot and killed uh, in front of his family driving home uh, through uh, 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 the corner of 34th, 34th and Cherry. Um, and I, although I did not know him, uh, he was well known to my friends and it was a very difficult conversation to have with my young children who, who knew of his children. And then a week later, uh, a woman I did know, uh, Gloria Leonidas, uh, whose daughter is in my son's class at school, was shot and killed by the Cafe Racer uh, um, murderer on Capitol Hill. Uh, it, 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 Eric and I actually were together in North Carolina when the news of Sandy Hook came through. And, uh, you know, I'll never forget it. I, I, and I, I don't know why, but, you know, it hit me harder than 9-11. I don't know, I, you know, I, I can't tell you why. And I, and I also want to acknowledge that for many communities in our country, these things happen every day and have been happening every day for a, genera a, a generation for decades. And I have no excuse for why it took these things <laughs> um, to, to, to force me to want to do something about it. But, you know, here I am. I have to tell you, I feel a little bit guilty about the fact that all of a sudden, because it happened, you know, closer to me, that all of a sudden it's a big old you know, it's a big old crisis. But, you know, when we, you know, w w you know after, uh, after ha spending two weeks without the capacity to think about anything else, you know, I sent Eric an email and said, look, I think we have to do something. Uh, and um, we proceeded uh, essentially uh, from three, uh, it w w with three ideas in mind. The first is that putting 
more guns with more lethality in the hands of more people is probably not a way to make our country either freer or safer. Uh, I mean, I, I simply point to, you know, I, I mean, you know, uh, 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 Gloria or Justin could have been armed to the teeth, and in neither, uh, in neither of those cases would that have prevented them from being killed. Um, and uh, and that, so that's the first thesis. And again, I, I have nothing against guns. I am a gun owner. I own two shotguns. They're in a safe in my, at my ranch in Montana. I'm not a hunter, but I do have those guns. I don't have a problem with people owning guns, but I do think that uh, every right uh, that our, um, our Constitution has granted us is, comes with some reasonable limitations, and we have to think about how to do that. The second theory of action is that it will take a new kind of political coalition to change the course of politics on this issue because obviously there's a very well organized, very well funded minority uh, position on this uh, and they have been up to this point essentially politically unopposed in our, in our communities, in our politics. And so um, although there are people in our state and around the nation who have litigated this issue with great intelligence and intensity, um, it's clear that they alone can't make a difference. So it's going to take business people and union leaders and, uh, and, and the public health community and citizens of all stripes uh, 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 and in all locations to come together to, to, to bring some kind of rational sense to this. And the third, and the third uh, issue that we uh, proceed under is that um, uh, being strategists is that it, what we do here in the state whether it is successful or not, draws the resources of our adversary. And even if we don't win in the state, we may help somebody else win elsewhere. And so the, the, that was the organizing principle of Washington Alliance for Guns Responsibility. And as we started it, tons of community leaders stepped up, people in this room like Tina Podladowski and Sally Bagshaw and Eric and Kristen immediately came uh, uh, to the rescue um, in terms of messaging, and so off we went. So one of the things that I want to ask, uh, you know, earlier today we were having a conversation about um, the initial spark of action and then the challenges of sustaining, sustaining will, sustaining action, sustaining energy um, on an issue. And in both cases, both at the national level, the, what you've been doing with Congress and, and Nick, what's been happening with the alliance uh, uh, in Olympia, um, there have been, you know, Sandy Hook was, of course, the, the most unwelcome and, and tragic kind of spark. Um, how do you approach this question of sustaining citizen engagement, sustaining a sense of ownership, right? One of the, one of the interesting things about the fact that majorities exist on any number of these questions about guns is that there's a difference between a majority of people when polled and asked a question, on the one hand, and on the other hand, a, a majority of people able and willing to be activated to actually act upon that opinion, right? How do we create that activation and how do you sustain the energy um, uh, in, on an issue where the tendency has been over the last 15 years, awful tragedies, time passes, people forget, quiet, awful tragedy, right? Repeat cycle. How do you sustain? One of the ways is a way that many people have talked about today, and that is sharing our stories. I think the Sandy Hook Elementary School tragedy was a wake-up call for many people to the ongoing incredible amount of violence that is happening every day in our country. The CDC reports that more than 30 people per day are murdered by guns. My kids, I live here in Seattle, have been in lockdown due to guns in the neighborhood twice in the last eight months alone. And if you took it the Moms Rising team across the country, we have stories like that just in our own Moms Rising team. One of my coworkers' daughter's very close friend, two weeks ago in Detroit, she had just got admitted to Smith College, was killed when she was putting gas in her car. This is happening everywhere. And these kind of issues coming up, all of us are touched by violence. So to your question of what keeps us sustaining, what keeps us going, our next step at Moms Rising is going to be to ask everybody, how are you being touched by violence in your community, in your life? How have your friends been touched by violence? And what do you think we can do about it together? To bring those stories together, and then we're going to go to Congress 
And we're going to deliver books of stories, books and books of stories, to each and every member of Congress, as well as to targeted and select state legislatures. And so that we know that this is not a one-time fluke, what's happening. This is an ongoing pattern. And we have patterns like this happening. We have a societal issue that must be addressed with a central structural solution, which in this instance, we think, is gun safety reform. So let me ask you, though, Kristen, uh, because you have a million plus members in Moms Rising, uh, they too can't be unanimous yes. uh, on this issue. You, you, yes. you have, I'm sure, uh, among the members of Moms Rising, uh, avid defenders of gun rights, avid defenders of the Second Amendment, and, avid, a, a, and, and gun owners who consider themselves responsible um, and view with great wariness any of what you're talking about here. How, how are you engaging them? Because you know, I'm, I'm hearing Mark and Joan still in my mind uh, about how we have this not be uh, on either side a preaching to the choir. Um, how have you learned with your own very diverse membership to, um, to not just preach to the choir? I think the first rule is that when we talk about what's going on to be very specific, the NRA leadership is often at incredible odds with the NRA membership. In fact, in a recent poll, over 90% of the general public supported universal background checks. 74% of NRA members support universal background checks. So when we're talking about these issues, we have to be very specific. We have to do like what Nick did and just say, hey, we're not trying to go around and take guns out of everybody's houses. We're not against all guns. We're against people owning weapons of mass destruction that make us worried about leaving our kids at school, at the mall, at a spa, I mean, you name it. We have technological advances that have happened in weaponry where we have weapons out there that are just only maintain, are only aimed at taking out people. So moving back to the specifics, and we do hear from our NRA members who are also Moms Rising members. We've had grandmas email us and say, you know what, the NRA leadership is out of step. I love hunting the ducks, and you know what, I want my grandchildren to be safe in school, and I am a NRA membership with pride. We've had NRA instructors who are also members of Moms Rising email us and say, you know, my primary uh, goal in life is gun safety and gun responsibility. And I think that the NRA leadership is out of step. So what Eric talked about in the beginning, which was that we have a very interesting and almost unique situation where we have a small minority of folks really sort of out of step with the majority of people. We see that in our membership that is crossing over with NRA membership as well. Nick, back to the question of sustainment, because we were talking a little bit about this over lunch um, and what it means to get a ball rolling. Because I have both the time and the resources and, and experience to uh, you know, galvanize political action. And so I can throw resources at things that most people can't. Um, but, uh, but, it, it, you know, over, but what I have learned uh, uh, is that you can't do it alone. And so what somebody like me can do is they can get a ball rolling, right? I can, I can uh, you know, one of the first things I did was go out and look for the best political operative in the state. And I hired Zach Silk, who ran the Marriage Equality uh, Initiative uh, 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 most recently and who is just unbelievably able, but I'm able to hire him and he can, and, and then all these incredible community leaders who are already, like, wanting to get things going were, you know, surfaced and, and together we can start to move things forward. But, and, and, and look, people like me uh, can afford to continue to fund these things at some level for a while, but ultimately it will take all of you. I mean, you, you, you know, we, we are going to run an experiment <laughs> here in this country and in this state about whether people actually care about gun responsibility and the violence we have in our society. And if you do, we're going to see change. And if you don't, we're not. But Kristen and I are not going to be able to do this on our own. Um, we're going to have to build a broad coalition of uh, citizen activists and leaders who want to push for reasonable reforms. And, and, and we can facilitate the, the, the sustenance of that effort, but we, you know, it, it, it's not, you know, it can't just be somebody like And what about you, Nick, reckoning with uh, folks uh, on the other side who, who, who regard with, uh, you know, hostility or suspicion um, any proposal to, whether it's on, under the mantle of gun responsibility or gun control or whatever the language might be, who, 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 who resist what you're talking about? So one of the first things I did was I uh, pulled together a dinner uh, uh, of a bunch of friends of mine who lead the Ducks Unlimited group. I'm not sure if you guys know what DU is, but it's a group of uh, hunters 
uh, who do, do you know, uh, uh, waterfowl-related conservation, but these are people very committed to guns and hunting and so on and so forth because I wanted to understand where they were coming from. And, uh, and you know, in that, in that group, there was a spectrum uh, from people who just didn't, for whom guns are a religious totem that, that, that define their personality and aren't really willing to even have a conversation about the possibility of any kind of limitation. Uh, but the, I would say that the majority opinion was, hell, you know, hell yes. <laughs> you know, we're responsible people. We accept uh, our responsibilities and take them seriously, and we're open to reasonable reforms. Uh, I think there are people you can't reach, but I think, I, I think that the vast majority of Americans, even gun owners and NRA members, are open to some kind of reasonable limitation on, on the, you know, the, the way in which we deal with these things in public. So, The, the final question I want to pose to you both is, is about, you know, Nick, when you said that, look, we're going to run this experiment, right, and in gross terms, either <laughs> enough people will have cared to make change or not, yeah. right, um, in broad strokes, that is certainly true. Um, one of the key obstacles, though, is uh, um, a thing we haven't talked as explicitly about today uh, on any of these issues, which is simply political power, right? Um, through the mechanisms of the republic and uh, of the democracy here and at, in, in our states, um, translating will of the public into action, um, unless it's by referendum or initiative, uh, runs through a whole machinery, right? a sausage-making machinery of legislation. Um, and it is in that machinery, uh, in state after state, uh, where a well-organized minority that wants to impede change uh, can actually do a very targeted, effective job of impeding it, right? And, and it happened. And that happened here in, in this state. In the state, on right? On background checks. That's right? right, in background checks, two Democratic uh, uh, state representatives derailed what was a very good uh, 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 law that was proceeding through the House, um, and they did it because, I mean, there's no other way to phrase it. They're owned lock, stock, and jock by the NRA, <laughs> and um, and for them, there's there's no reason. No one has ever given them a reason to 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 to, to do anything else, and it's incumbent upon us, uh, and we are determined to do it to make them pay a huge political price for that. And we're organizing efforts right now to do that. that that's how our system works. Um, we are, we are going to try to get them unelected. <laughs> and, and, so, uh, and so, you know, time will tell whether how effective those efforts are. But I guarantee you uh, they're going to they're gonna at least have something else to think about in the future. So, so Kristen, uh, with you on this question of the system of power, right, um, so much of what you've been describing has been the harvesting, the, the, the listening and then the, and, the, and the breathing back out, the harvesting of story and voice and then the kind of amplified expression of that voice, which is so central to making anybody believe in democracy and making them believe that this system works. Uh, but at the end of the day, after you've delivered the thumb drives and after you have shown up at these places and uh, done things, uh, either X number of members of this committee uh, will be willing to move a bill out of committee and give it a chance on the floor or X member, X minus one will. Right? Um, what have you been doing on that kind of, on the mechanics of power uh, at the federal level to convert that amplified expression of will uh, into, uh, into action? I think one of the biggest problems that we're all facing at Citizen University and across the country is our belief that we don't have power to start. And I'll just have a moment here because this is a big deal. As I've worked at Moms Rising, and actually I started organizing when I was 19. I've seen over and over again that the voices of real people, the stories of real people, actually make a huge impact for real. It's, even I am surprised over and over again, and I've been doing this for a long time and really believe in it. And so one of the things that we were actually talking about a little bit in the back before we came on is how particularly inside the Beltway, there's kind of a dome over it. Imagine them actually living in a snow globe. I think the Beltway lives in a snow globe, and they cannot hear main streets across the country, and there's sort of this inside conversation. And being able to come forward and bring forward regular people's voices, regular people, what we're experiencing are sadness, our grief, our anger, and our hope for justice. 
actually has a significant impact. And in fact, what we're finding over and over again is that elected leaders are calling to us and are saying, what are you hearing? What are people hearing? We want to hear the stories. We want your members up on the stand with us to share their story inside the Beltway. Can we fly them in? Now, this is moving to political power because what's happening is sharing our stories is making the personal political. And it's making the personal political and moving to political capital. Because of those of us in the room who are women know that we're 51% of the vote, and you do not want to mess with your mother. <laughs> that is not OK. So the political capital is stronger. I think the first answer to that question is that I worry about your question. Because the political capital is stronger just in this room, in who we are right now, than we would ever imagine. And our voices are more powerful than we would ever imagine. And we have a new modern media kit in front of all of us where each of us can tweet, we can Facebook, we can blog. 90% of us are now online. And we can go around the traditional media to have our voices directly heard by elected leaders in ways that they have to answer because the questions are being asked in public. So I urge everybody here today who cares one way or another about this to flex your citizen muscle and to reach out both to your state legislators as well as your members of Congress and say, let's get moving. We need gun safety for all of us. We need safe communities and we need a safe nation. And that is all. <laughs> okay, well, that's, that, that, that's a good answer. And, you know, uh, in, in closing this, I, I want to, uh, Nick mentioned that uh, uh, the, the, the fellow who's been hired to, to run day to day this Washington Alliance for Gun Responsibility is a fellow named Zach Silk. Uh, uh, Zach might be in the house. I'm not sure if, uh, if he is. Uh, but but uh, Zach uh, ran the uh, Referendum 74, uh, the successful uh, uh, measure to, uh, uh, to create marriage equality in this state. And actually, I think that's a, that, that is a great case study and analog uh, for how, Kristen, your point, the power that we all have as people ends up getting expressed over time, right? Uh, I believe it was Darnell this morning who showed us that kind of quick uh, comparison of historical public opinion uh, polls on this issue uh, going back just, you know, less than two decades compared to today uh, and the way in which there has been this norm shift. And really, uh, to Nick's earlier point about winds being contagious or about action in one place affecting uh, and changing the mindset of how action might unfold in another place. Uh, I, I do believe that the passage of referendum 74 here is in fact rapidly accelerating yes. the acceptance of marriage equality around the country yeah. today. Right? That <clears throat> and the shift in culture, which is so at the heart of these big deal. These That's things. exactly right. Do, do right. you want to say a word just yeah, about the I culture just, piece? Yeah, I just, uh, uh, you know, I hate to admit it, but the gun issue, the violence issue, is clearly a man problem. I mean, let, let's just be clear, you know, this is a problem of men. And, you know, I think that, I think that women can take, in the same way that women changed the culture around driving while drunk, women in this country have, have the power to change the culture of violence. You know, they, it, look, there are 600,000 people in the state of Washington that have a, 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 a permit to carry a concealed weapon. You tell me why anyone other than law enforcement needs to carry a loaded weapon in public. Because we have a police department. Yeah, it, thank you. Uh, you know, like, they, they're, they're, you know, this isn't a sign of strength. This is a sign of fear. And, and, and it needs to be called out, right? Driving drunk used to, be a, used to be a swashbuckling, you know, look at me. Well, not anymore. And I think that changing the culture is so important. Well, uh, this is a conversation that um, we wanted to open up here. And we know that, again, there is the specific content of the issue of guns, but then there is the deeper underlying strategic structural question of how do we express voice? How do we find power? How do we change the culture, right? And whether it's on marriage equality or perhaps uh, sometime soon on gun responsibility, the reality is that norms change when you decide that norms should change, right? Uh, and whatever your view is on this issue, it is incumbent upon us to actually uh, lean in, to keep using that phrase, uh, and to find your voice as a citizen and say, look, I think this is an issue in particular on guns where because of the violent nature of it, there is a, 
there's a measure of, of, of fear and even intimidation about exploring the issue uh, and wanting to go there. And it seems touchy. It seems dangerous. It is, in fact, dangerous uh, inherently. We have to hold each other and hold a space with just the same kind of courage that Mark Meckler and Joan Blades did, just the same kind of courage that Jose Antonio Vargas shows when he goes to places and settings where nobody wants an illegal around, and where we have to be able and willing to open our hearts and our heads and say, we are not sure we agree, but we are sure that we have to see each other and hear each other and try to understand in that same way that Joan does with the living room conversations, what are your values? What are you scared of? What do you want for your kids and for the future? And from that foundation, I believe it's possible not just for us to connect with one another on these hard issues, but it is then possible to set in motion these cascades of norm changes that make political change possible. So please join me in thanking Kristen Ralph Finkbeiner and Nick Hanauer. <clears throat>